Thank you everybody for uh, joining us for the City of Courtney's Community of the Whole meeting for January 25th, 2021. Uh, I'd like to first start by respectfully acknowledging that we um, are gathering and Zooming on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And our preamble around uh, COVID-19 that the City of Courtney with the authority of Ministerial Order M192, Local Government Meetings and Bylaw Process, Order Number 3, implemented changes to its Open Council meetings. In the interest of public health and safety and in accordance with section 3.1 minister order number three m192 in-person attendance by members of the public and at council meetings will not be permitted until further notice council meetings will be presided over by the mayor or acting mayor with electronic participation by council and staff via live web streaming and with that uh we can get right into our first presentation um, which will be uh, Inspector Mike Kerber. Does somebody would like to move that? Move. Second. All right. And Inspector Kerber, I'll pass it right on over to you if you'd like to share your screen. And I will do that right now. Hello, everyone. So that should be up in front of you now. Can you see that? Looks fantastic. Thanks again for uh, presenting today. Not a problem. Uh, this is going to be a little bit condensed. So it's going to kind of uh, involve the second and third quarter uh, reporting for, for Courtney. So it's basically, I'm calling a year on report, but just uh, I've cut out some slides that uh, aren't going to interest you. I'll give you some of uh, the ideas of what's uh, going on in the community here. So calls for service, anytime you see uh, CFS, that means calls for service in my language. So you can see here the overall percentage of uh, calls for service went up 6% in Courtney, went up 4% in Comox down in Cumberland and the rural areas uh, went up 3%. So that, and you can see the gray is 2019 and the blue is 2020. So if, if you weren't aware, uh, we don't run January to January for our fiscal year, we run April to April. So right now we are in quarter four. So by March 31st, that'll wrap up our, our fourth quarter and then that's when I start calling you about the performance plan and starting to plan and see what your priorities are. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, and that's the kind of calls for service to date when we took this uh, this poll. So you can see we had about, uh, you know, 14,000 calls for service uh, by that, that, that when this was taken. I can say uh, for a year, we're probably going to estimate it's going to be about 20,000 calls for service in the community, which is a little bit up from uh, what we're used to. So robberies, uh, I went to and took some of the major or uh, the more significant types of crime uh, robbery was one of them. Um, you can see last year we had 14 calls. Uh, this year's 13. And you can see comparisons to uh, the other communities. Uh, major crime took six of uh, the robbery files, so they're significant because it involved multiple uh, uh, locations and people. And uh, they were 100% success rate with that. So that's, that's very good. And that's good for them. Uh, the other ones are usually done by our street crimes. They're very successful. And then uh, the watches or the general duty members take care of the others. Assaults, again, that's gone up significantly. Uh, I, I don't know if I can make a correlation to COVID-19. Uh, people are more inclined to stay home. They're uh, you know not going to work. They're closer together for longer periods of time. And uh, like I say, I, I don't know if that's, that's a correlation or not, but that's kind of the, uh, the scoring right there. To date, it's 364 files for assault in, in the Courtney region. And then you can see the comparisons. Sex offenses have gone up, which is uh, it's concerning to me. Um, I can't give you a reason why that's happening, um, but these are the stats we have. Again, it's, it's all across the board. Everywhere we see the only person that went down, uh, area that went down is like the regional district. Everywhere else it's gone up. And you can see right there the stat that most of these happen in the residences, which uh, can lead uh, to believe that because of COVID-19, people are more likely to be home and at, at the residences. Break and enters, 5% uh, increase in beanies. A lot of these are from our prolific offenders, uh, people that we know about, and we have to spend a, a great deal of time collecting evidence because uh, some people don't report it. And then when we do, we need the evidence to support charges. And typically we need uh, a quite extensive uh, 
purport the Crown Council package for Crown to approve charges. A lot of uh, our clients that we do arrest are released pretty much right away. We have our bail hearings right in the, in the jail here in our in our cell block, and uh, most individuals are released on paper. So when we do arrest like a prolific offender, if uh, he doesn't have a whole stack of charges laid against the person, then they will be released with conditions. And that's where we end up breaching everybody where they're not supposed to be in a certain area or there's conditions that impose on them. And, and that takes a long time for us to kind of build on those breaches for our Crown to recognize and lay charges on that. They kind of, if I can I use the term stack, they stack all those breaches together and then they deal with them all at once. So we have to do a lot of work with that. It's frustrating from our side when we do, uh, we are at the front end trying to arrest people and the way uh, the world is now, uh, a lot of people are getting released right off the, right off the face of it. Uh, so it's frustrating to us to see that happen. Auto theft. So there's 24 more auto theft uh, files. So these are vehicles being just taken without permission, obviously. So uh, Courtney has 79 to date. Uh, and we're finding that Fords are seem to be a target right now. So that's where we're at. You can see the uh, overall community. Cumberland's gone down, the rural area has gone up a bit, uh, and so has Comox. So it's, it's, it's not just uh, localized to one community, it's the whole Comox Valley. Theft from vehicles, so we've, we've stopped a bit of that, and I, don't, I can't say why. Uh, like I said, we do a pretty good job of identifying our, our prolific offenders. Some of the ones we, uh, uh, we used to be regular clients, we've kind of, they've kind of moved out of the community, gone to another community. So that's part of the reason that that's a decrease in that area. Uh, theft and shoplifting. Uh, we're pretty good at that. The, uh, the businesses like uh, Walmart and uh, shoppers and London drugs and a lot of the bigger businesses are, have their uh, loss prevention officers, LPOs that help us out quite a bit. They kind of help us identify and, and do their surveillance and do their, uh, you know, targeting of individuals coming into their stores. So we help with that and they give us a call and we kind of kind of deal with that. Uh, Bike Unit is working on a project right now to kind of help with that and see if we can uh, work on some of our clients. So again, there is a significant number of files in the community for that and uh, pretty much across the board where, you know, where the businesses are, like uh, Walmart is very uh, busy with this area. Uh, they, they, they have a lot of losses per day uh, and some of the other bigger retailers are the same way. Mischief, uh, that's mischief to property and just a loss of enjoyment of property. Uh, we've gone up in that area. Uh, pretty much everybody's kind of the same. Uh, the only people that have really gone down or only community, pardon me, is, is Cumberland. Drugs, you can see there, and if you can read that little screen in the middle. So uh, that's, that's a topic for later. Um, drugs is uh, it's not a big issue like uh, the bigger communities. We do have our issues with a uh, bit of the drug trade and some of the, the, the addicts but we kind of work with that and work with the local community and work through that. So pair drivers, that's gone down. Uh, for the most part, that's actually pretty good. Uh, most people are, are educated. I took a long time to educate individuals and most people have designated drivers. And just the fact that uh, a lot of places are shutting down at eight o'clock or 10 o'clock at night has kind of stopped a lot of it as well. Uh, Mental Health Act, those are... Um, individuals that are having a crisis of one way or another that we have to intervene with. Uh, and those are the number of files we deal with. A lot of these are gonna be individuals that we deal with on a regular basis. A lot of files are generated and we work really hard to try and get them to community services. Uh, we have our crisis nurse program where we can call the nurse into our, our cell block to assess them right there, or we take them right to the uh, to hospital and get them the proper care. So our first response to these is to get them the care they need and then we kind of deal with the other components like the criminal aspect afterwards. And that is it, uh, moving forward. Uh, we're still working on uh, some of the problem areas. Uh, 
the uh, some of the problem houses that I know you're aware of, we've been working with uh, the different communities are working on angles and, and uh, action plans to kind of sort that out. Uh, from our side, uh, like I said, we're going to be 20,000 plus files this year. Uh, and that's, I think, going to be the norm for the next couple of years. Uh, I do have one introduction uh, to kind of put this in there. Uh, we do have Staff Sergeant uh, Troy Beauregard in place now. So if you remember Eric Rochette, uh, he left back in June. So Troy is now in place here as our Ops NCO. And he comes from uh, Campbell River. So he didn't move very far but he's our new uh, operations NCO. So if you need to get a hold of him, uh, you can just uh, last name of Beauregard. And as usual, I'm still available for any calls. If you need to call me direct, I'm fine with that. And uh, I guess I can open it, up, open it up for questions. Excellent, thanks very much for the report. Uh, and uh, we do have Councillor Hillian. Thanks very much, uh, Inspector Curvers. Uh, appreciate you being with us today and the work that uh, you and your members are doing to uh, keep our community as safe as possible under obviously difficult circumstances. Two questions. Um, first of all, uh, your calls for service. Uh, I've been uh, trying to encourage people with minor uh, matters rather than phoning to use your online system. And I'm assuming that uh, your online reporting system counts uh, as a, a call for service, uh, does it? Yes, it does. Uh, so it comes into our intake center and then we actually screen the calls. Uh, sometimes there's no action because a lot of uh, reporting requirements means that you're not gonna get a call from a policeman. Uh, some uh, like myself, I'll screen them or our uh, Constable Vandermolen, who's our call manager, will screen those. And if there's actionable items on them, we will take care of that either by dealing with that directly ourselves or we uh, you know, delegate to one of the members on the watch to kind of deal with that if there's uh, some legwork involved. And in a related uh, matter, um, how are we doing with um, the waiting times for people who do phone in uh, these days? Uh, I know we've had some issues at uh, different times in the past, but I'm just wondering how you're managing uh, with that these days. So we're talking right to our front counter or are they talking to the dispatch center? To the dispatch. Uh, well, they are on their own, to their own entity, if I can say that. They're in our building, but they are trained to screen calls. Uh, that's their their process if, if the person's insistent they'll take a call and then they have an in one person will be as the intake person for the day so they'll screen the calls and they'll ask certain questions to be specific because we have to prioritize the calls and i've mentioned this before they get prioritized from one to four where ones and twos are getting immediate response and threes and fours are going to have to wait and then uh, a policeman will call them later on if that's the case so our yeah i was thinking more about the actual time waiting on hold to to, to make the report, uh, which has been an issue at times in the past. And I think that is a case if they're on a call with a priority one or two uh, file or a response, somebody's gonna be put on hold uh, because they're gonna screen them right at the front end. And, and I, I actually can't speak to that. I can talk to the manager up at OCC and see what kind of delays they have, but then I can report back if you like. Yeah, no worries. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention and then I'll pass was um, uh, the, the increase in, uh, assaults and also uh, sexual offenses uh, and you've indicated nearly 60 percent of those are happening in residences uh, which I believe is in line with uh, what the uh, transition society has experienced uh, this year with a lot more people uh, seeking refuge, re refuge in relation to domestic violence um, and I'm just wondering if uh, if you still have any officers uh, specifically assigned to that work or is it more a, a general uh, response these days? Well, we initially uh, do the general response with our frontline officers, but we do have two ladies in our domestic violence unit uh, that deal with that specifically and with the domestic side. So they are fully engaged and uh, anytime we need a little bit of more action, uh, they work with uh, creating safety plans and dealing with uh, the victims and the clients alike and uh, working through that process. Good to know, thanks very much. All right. And uh, Councillor um, uh, Moore. Great, thank you, Mayor. A um, couple questions. The first one, I'm just wondering if you have any insight or any theories on why there's been a decrease in Cumberland. Are they doing something right out there that we should be doing or do you have any ideas around that? I think just all the facilities and the, uh, the needs uh, the clients have are in Courtney. Right. Um, and then the other one was, 
I know that you've, um, I've heard, you know, good things about um, responses with those folks you talked about with mental health issues and getting them connected to the hospital and other services. I, I wondered if that was the same for people with addiction um, who may or may not have mental health attached who are maybe committing a lot of the, the property crime and things like mm -hmm. that to, um, to finance uh, or to um, feed their addiction. If there's um, anything in place that kind of helps link them to services. I know if someone's charged, obviously, and then they're convicted or, or they have conditions, yeah. they're attached to probation and probation is very good at, at linking people to, to services. But I wondered if there was something, um, you know, prior to someone being charged or if they don't get charged or um, just that kind of social services piece to link in to maybe help um, support that person. Uh, that's where our crisis nurses program comes in, where we uh, a lot of individuals will have a crisis because of either an addiction or, or a mental health uh, condition. That's where they're there for to assess that so we can make an appropriate decision on where we're going to send them to. Right. So you are including. So if someone's presenting primarily with an addiction issue and not necessarily mental health, then they would still be linked in with those yeah. services. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Great. Thanks a lot. And next we have uh, Councillor Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And thank you very much, Inspector Curvers, for the, uh, the report. There was one of the slides that really drew my attention. It was the, um, it was the assault uh, figures and it was the graph of the year. And uh, there seemed to be a fairly steep decline from a real peak in October down to December. And yeah. uh, it, which is in some ways counterintuitive because it seems to have gone up during the sort of the summer and early fall when restrictions were lower. And then it seems to have decreased um, heading in towards December. It's also quite low in April and May. I was just wondering if you, if you had any thoughts on, on what's shaping that pattern? It's hard to say. Um, I think a lot of it is based on what uh, the province is doing for restrictions. Uh, again, a lot of this is because people are in close contact or close quarters for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, I know it's dropped in December and, and I honestly don't know what's causing that. Um, it's, it's, it's a guessing game sometimes on what causes this. Okay, so there's no sort of change in practice or in way you've been handling assault charges? No, we uh, deal with them all. We, all. we have a protocol. We deal with them all the same. Uh, the frontline officers respond and then we assess as we go there. Okay, thank you. And I noticed also in... Um, that the, the total number of calls for service also declined uh, from sort of peaked in October and went down to November and actually dropped below the 2019 average in, in December. Do you happen to know besides assault if there were other types of uh, activities that, were, that were, you were seeing a decline in towards the end of the year when we went into heavier lockdown? Well, to be honest, I only picked uh, certain crime types. If you have anything specific that you, you're interested in, I can definitely pull that up. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. Okay. No, the, um, I, I guess I would be curious, um, given the concern about sexual offenses that are happening during lockdown, to know if that, if, if that followed the same trend as assault uh, in terms of seeing a decrease yeah, no, in November, I, December. We can make that analysis if, uh, if there's something specific uh, we want to look at. If I can get an email or some kind of direction on what you want, then I can definitely dig that up for you. Okay, sure. I'll maybe send an email through uh, through the mayor then. Thanks very much. Yeah, okay. Excellent. And Councillor Theos. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Inspector Curvers, for the presentation. Uh, Inspector Curvers, I wanted to um, I wanted to ask about the uh, the mischief and uh, when you were when you were showing the mischief graph, uh, it it appears to be um, in Courtney the mischief uh, has risen by what looks to be over 20% over the mm -hmm. year or at that point. And uh, in all of the other areas, um, uh, it, it appears to have actually dropped uh, from when I looked at that uh, graph. Mm -hmm. It was only in Courtney where there was an increase and that increase was steep. Now I'm wondering, um, uh, maybe if we go back to that slide, see if I'm correct or not. I, I, mean, I don't see it now, but. But yeah, I think all yeah. three other areas had a had a decrease in that mischief, and we had a significant increase. Uh, Stand by. There we go. 
Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it confirms that. Okay. Uh, thank you so kindly. So now I'm wondering, uh, you know, as to, you know, what your thoughts were. I know you spoke, touched on it a little bit as to why, um, why that may be spiking such as that. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing east to west uh, as in terms of mm -hmm. where some of our challenges may be and, and uh, some of the direction of where, you know, we could put more, um, more, uh, uh, I would say a focused attention towards uh, a particular area or not, but I'm also going to ask you um, um, on top of the mischief uh, uh, scenario uh, is um, in regards to density, you know, areas that are growing in our community uh, in inspector curvers, are we seeing uh, that density um, uh, uh, bring some, you know, more challenges as in terms of, uh, of, uh, of calls and, and public safety? Well, I know I, I live in the Ridge and I yeah. know my neighbor had his car broken into and a laptop stolen. So we're getting a trickle effect a little bit because uh, at the end of Comox logging road, I know there's uh, some people living in there. Uh, so it, it does kind of work itself out from the core. Uh, a lot of these calls uh, are gonna be online reporting where they report something and there's no actionable activity we can do. And a lot of it is the tagging that's been going on because we had a prolific mm -hmm. tagger. Mm -hmm. So that's going to escalate. And the tagging, it takes a big portion of the files. And uh, we actually have a run, still have a running log to keep a track of that as well. Thank you, Inspector Kerbers. And uh, maybe I'll ask a couple of questions uh, um, as well. Uh, so. Do you guys um, actually have a percentage of how many uh, calls are done through the online reporting system versus uh, phone-in calls? I'd have to look that up. Uh, it's not a big percentage because I, I don't see a lot of, call, of calls, but a lot of it are screened at the front end. Yeah. But uh, I can definitely find out a percentage, but it's, it's not that large yet because it's still a new system and people aren't aware of it yet. So mm -hmm. we do have the, the reporting. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, a lot of it is non-actionable reports about, uh, you know, someone took the keys out of my uh, dashboard and there's no evidence. We have no video surveillance. We have nothing really uh, we can follow up on. And then uh, we move forward from there. So a lot of those are those type of offenses where we can't action anything. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And, and uh, the other question I had uh, was around graffiti just because uh, I've gotten a few uh, questions around that and, and, you know, basically, you know, uh, from from the city's perspective, it, it's up to the private owners to um, sort of clean up the graffiti. Uh, but just uh, just because you sort of said that you've seen a spike, is is that an ongoing spike, or did you say that the the prolific offender has been? Uh... No, it kind of co comes and goes. It's in waves. Uh, we've got a, uh, uh, an interest in a few individuals that we're aware of doing it, so we kind of keep tabs on them, trying to see what what the what's happening. Um, I know uh, the downtown core gets hit. Uh, you know, you got uh, Nikki Raman got tagged on their their uh, tents there, uh, trying to identify that, and and we're working towards that. So it's very difficult because it's you know people working in the shadows. Uh, a lot of the video surveillance is not the best. Uh, lighting is not the best. So and everybody wears a mask and a hood now. So it's a very difficult to identify people. We do have individuals we know that do this, and this is in their uh, so we're aware of them. So we try and follow up with that as best we can. But uh, it, it kind of goes in ebbs and flows. No, oh, fair enough. No, th thanks for that. Um, and um, and that was basically, was that the two quarters already or did you? Uh... No, I haven't. Uh, the other two reports, I'll just uh, pull them up here. I'll do the second quarter first for introduction. Yeah. So um, this is just some of the... Uh, Okay, here we go. I'll go here. So second quarter, which is, uh, you see there is from July to September. And uh, you can, if you can read along there, it says there's an 8% increase in calls for service in the second quarter. And uh, we broke it down to, so in the second quarter, in same time last year, there was 3,752 calls. This year we had 4,041. So that's in a three month span, we had over 4,000 calls for service. Uh, for the traffic part of it, you uh, you can see the type of calls we have. And, and traffic is uh, uh, fender benders, uh, hit and runs, 
anything traffic related that will that'll get scored as a traffic offense. And we'll kind of work through that. Uh, as property crime, it says you had 11 fewer break and enters as comparative to last year. You can see the numbers there, 60 last year and this time and 49. Uh, like I said, we've been pretty good at identifying our prolific offenders or property offenders and trying to get them some uh, care in some of our facilities. Yep, you can say that. Fair enough. Uh, and uh, again, a 22% increase in motor vehicle uh, files. So you can see here when it says prolific offenders, uh, there were four individuals who are basically took a lot of bulk files. And uh, we identify these people, and then we try and, uh, you know, get charge approval from Crown. Okay, excellent. And uh, it looks like Councillor Hilling has uh, another question or comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Inspector Curvers, uh, I'm just wondering in general um, how uh, you're finding uh, morale among the uh, your members uh, to be these days. It's uh, Maybe not been the easiest time to uh, to be in the policing service, uh, given the, the the general societal criticism that um, your agency is often subject to. Um, you know, and while I think uh, we continue to have excellent relationships, and I, I particularly appreciate the engagement uh, you have with the different community agencies, uh, um, I just wonder how. Uh, how you're finding that uh, that whole issue uh, to be impacting your members? Morale's good. Uh, we we do have our limitations so because of uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, we do have support staff. We still have the ability to, for people to work from home. That's still in place. If they need to do that, we can do that. Uh, we do have a few individuals taking uh, taking that option, which is fine. Uh, uh, unfortunately for us, we're frontline policing. It's very difficult for us to work from home. Uh, in the past, what I've done is uh, with our watches, we allowed uh, when we're, our resources are in place and we had the numbers, we allowed a couple of members per watch to be work from home. We would send them home with a laptop and they can work on their files and their investigations from home during that uh, four day uh, block they would have. Right, so so that's uh, that's good uh, uh, as an adaptation to the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure, though, you're you're in the, you're you're seeing um, the tensions in the different uh, sectors of the community uh, as we continue with lockdown and restrictions, and yeah. uh, and people just uh, having a perhaps a harder time than usual, uh, particularly the um, the vulnerable folk who uh, maybe live on the streets and other situations where uh, access to services has been more difficult during this uh, this challenging time. Yeah, no, we do try and get them the services they need. Uh, we, uh, with the COVID-19 component, we really try and do the education component before. I know you hear for other communities uh, writing tickets for violations. Uh, we really try and do the education component first. And if they really want to be, uh, you know, if they're repeat offenders and it's a continual thing, then we have that option to, to, to take that, uh, use the, the ticket for that. So we haven't done it yet. Uh, most people that we come in contact with are pretty good. Uh, and respond pretty good to what we're asking them to do. So it's it's not being that hard of a challenge for us right now. Well, thanks again. And I know you always en encourage us to um, um, advocate for people to report, even if they think nothing's gonna happen, that it's important to uh, to let your uh, officers know uh, when, when something has happened that um, threatens uh, persons or property. And uh, so I, I just want to express appreciation for the work that uh, your folks do, you and your folks. It's it's a difficult challenge at the best of times. Uh, and I believe we're fortunate to, to have you uh, doing the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, excellent. And then um, was there another one last report? Uh, yes, the third quarter. So it's, it's what I've done, uh, if you're not aware, we uh, work on quarters and like I said earlier, we work from April to April. So each quarter is uh, part of our annual performance plan. So what I decided to do was I was uh, for each uh, community, I'm breaking it down per quarter. So you'll get quarterly reports about uh, basically the file count and what we're doing. It's a quick report. It gives you kind of a snapshot of what we're doing and what we're up to. And it's uh, each 
each report is obviously for each community, like Comox will get their own and, and uh, Cumberland will get their own as a regional district. So this is the third quarter. So if I go back up here, you can see the third quarter is from October to December. And basically we, from last year, we had a 6% increase in calls for service. And then you can see the numbers there and that uh, just that those few files, that's a 6% percent increase. Um, there's uh, 70 more traffic files and uh, the increase is obviously what we're, we're giving bike unit a little bit of credit here because they do a lot of this stuff. They generate a lot of good work. Um, so we had an increase in that. So they are very proactive, our bike unit. They're very good at doing, uh, you know, monitoring our prolific offenders and identifying uh, problem spots and trying to work with solutions to kind of get that result. Uh, property crime, if I go down a little bit further, oh, hang on, I missed one. Traffic, no, I talked that. Uh, property crime, uh, 28 fewer files than last year. And part of that is some of our offenders are in, in jail and some have moved out of the community, but we still have our uh, individuals that we have to keep uh, tabs on. Uh, 35 more thefts from motor vehicle. And again, the crime reduction, uh, basically, if you can read there, again, 20 files or more. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, they have the uh, one crisis or one way or another, which you're trying to deal with the best we can. So you'll see another one of these uh, at the end of March or maybe shortly in April. And that'll give you kind of the grand total of, uh, of the things going on in our community. Excellent. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and, and I think Councillor Hillian uh, did uh, raise the point of encouraging people to uh, make sure that they are uh, reporting anything um, uh, whenever it's happening as soon as possible so that you guys get that information, uh, whether a, a vehicle rolls or not. Um, it, it's absolutely critical, I think, to, to make sure that that's happening. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there's been a you know, it, it's been a couple of years now, but the, the community uh, policing, having the bicycle cops and folks going out there is, is at a, a pretty positive uh, outcome. And, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously there's always room for improvement, but uh, I think uh, one, one of the conversations that happened, I just want to thank you uh, when the BIA uh, Downtown Business uh, Association were um, a little bit concerned about backyard fires or back alley fires, I should say, and, and other things that were going on. Uh, you know, uh, getting uh, you uh, offering up uh, staff to make sure people get that um, reinforced training on what to do uh, when those things are happening. I just want to appreciate that. Yeah, no, uh, Corporal Cliff and uh, Constable Colin Curtis will be heading uh, heading to the meeting, uh, coming up meeting here. Excellent. Uh, that's great. I don't see any uh, further questions. So again, I just want to thank, thank you for uh, uh, coming and presenting this and uh and with that i think uh i'll call a vote uh, uh it's just for information so i'm going to assume everybody is in favor unless you wave your hands uh vigorously in opposition and seeing no one doing that uh inspector Kerbridge, you're free to go thank you very much take care thank you sir have a nice day and next under financial services we have the covid 19 safe restart grants if someone would like to move that. I'll move the recommendation, uh, Mr. Mayor. If you'd like me to read it. Uh, sure, if you want to read it and then eventually we'll we'll get somebody to second it. I think I think Councilor Cole Hamilton's ready to second. I'll move that uh, based on the January 25th, 2021 staff report, COVID-19 safe restart grants for local governments that council direct staff to incorporate the attached 2020 to 2022 proposed use of COVID-19 safe restart grant for local governments in the 2020 year end and 2021 to 2025 financial plan. And that staff be directed to pay back the gaming fund $725,000 for the 2020 fiscal year to recognize the loss of revenue in the fund and use the COVID-19 safe restart grant to fund policing and the infrastructure reserve contribution in 2020. Second. Excellent. And I'll pass it over to staff if they'd like to talk. Uh, Trevor Krishner. 
Mayor, I'll pass this over to Jennifer Nelson, our Director of Financial Services, to summarize the report and take any questions that Council may have. Okay, uh, thank you to the CAO, to Mayor and Council. Uh, so the intent of this report was uh, to provide Council with a recommended use of the COVID-19 Safe Restart Grant for local government. Um, this report has been reviewed in detail with the Finance Select Committee on January 15th, um, and it's been endorsed. So essentially in November of 2020, we received uh, $4.1 million uh, from the provincial government with, um, in addition to that, they provided us with a letter outlining the eligible costs um, that would be allowed to be used uh, with this grant. And then, and we've attached a copy of the letter to this report. Um, later on in December, early January, we received some further um, clarification and uh, details around the use of the funds as well as the reporting requirements. So some of that additional information that um, we've taken into account from, from that is that this is intended to be a liquidity infusion to help mu municipalities deal with the increase costs and revenue losses um, with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to note that the funds cannot be used to reduce taxes or keep uh, the tax rate artificially low. Um, and the province anticipates that local governments will use this money through 2020, 2021, and maybe 2022. Um, and they also uh, outlined the re reporting requirements. So we, we need to provide detailed reporting that will be included in our financial statements. So with that information, that is what helped to guide us uh, in preparing this proposed recommended, recommended use of the funds. So on page uh, 21 of the agenda is where we've attached the schedule um, outlining the recommended use. And this again was revert, re reviewed uh, with the Finance Select Committee. Uh, so essentially what staff are recommending um, is to bring in approximately half of the revenue into 2020 uh, to assist with offsetting um, some significant losses within uh, the gaming fund as well as revenue, uh, sorry, recreation revenues. So we would bring that into 2020 and then we've outlined in 2021 the proposed use um, within the uh, financial plan. That, so once we receive endorsement, we would then roll this into our financial planning process. Uh, so you can see in 2021, again, we're recommending to um, pay back the gaming fund. And what this would do, it was a, would allow council to maintain their planned uh, spending pattern within the gaming fund. Um, that's assuming we see those gaming revenues come back in 2021. Um, as well as reserving some funds, about 500000 to um, support further losses in recreation revenue that the city is experiencing. Uh, we've outlined uh, $100,000 to support the city hall renovations to allow for reopening. $84,000 uh, for additional bylaw enforcement support and $200,000 uh, for uh, downtown washroom for the public and vulnerable. And then lastly, in 2021, that's leaving uh, 200,000 remaining uh, that could be used for any other uh, anticipated, unanticipated expenses that may arise or um, other, other uh, related services council may choose to uh, use those funds for uh, as long as they are within the, the um, eligible cost uh, components of, of the use of those funds. So maybe with that said, I'll just open it up for some questions from council. Excellent, thank, thanks so much, uh, Jennifer, appreciate it. And, and I just wanna thank uh, uh, Councillor uh, Haley and uh, Cole Hamilton and McCollum for uh, you know, uh, uh, run in with the, the finance committee. Uh, I know it was our, our first meeting in, in about a year, but uh, I think it was really, really a, a great meeting. Thanks to staff for the great report and laying this all out uh, fairly straightforward. Like, uh, and, and with that, uh, we, Councillor Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Mayor, and thanks to staff for the report. Um, my question has to do with 
the uh, the grant and aid funding that we had cut does that um, flow out of our um, of our gaming funds? Is that is that where that money lives or comes from? Yes, that's correct. The gaming or the grant and aid uh, was funded through gaming. Hmm. Okay, so would we uh, expect to maybe start that up again for um, 2022? I believe. So um, you'll recall council passed a resolution in the summer to not move ahead with that program in 2021. Um, if the, the, the finance select com committee also did review the gaming matrix, which I don't have here in this report, but part of our, our work was to take a look at that. And based on this strategy and assuming that gaming funds come back into play uh, by the end of 2021, that that would be the recommended approach is to reinstate the, the grant and aid program for 2022. Okay, thank you very much. And Councillor McCollum. Having a hard time finding the mute button. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thanks for the report, Jennifer. Um, it's uh, great to see this come to council so we can all discuss it and um, I think the the way that it's been laid out and um, presented, it, it makes good sense for the city's um, finances going forward. Um, one question that occurred to me that um, it never uh, came up when we discussed this at the finance committee is, um, given that we're able to kind of plan for revenue shortfalls in our um, parks and recreation budget in advance of the, the budget coming forward, is that gonna um, provide some opportunity to um, be less concerned about, um, I guess, or better opportunities maybe for um, programming or, or planning and not having to be uh, really cognizant of um, filling programs and perhaps make it easier to provide um, the summer programming that we uh, saw in a limited capacity this year. It, are we imagining that we'll be able to provide a little bit more service um, knowing that this funding's in place? Yeah, so um, this, the recreation has been pre preparing their budget, assuming they'd be offering um, limited services around the health order. To, so we've taken those, we're, we'll be taking that all into account uh, when, de when developing the 2021 uh, financial plan. Um, so this, this does, by setting these funds aside, this does support with that so that it gives us an opportunity um, obviously, we, we don't know for sure what the uptake is going to be and um, what this will do is support us in terms of if there are further losses or it doesn't quite pan out exactly as, as the plan, um, then we have those funds there to support. And in addition to that, it is, um, it is one of those line items that we know we're going to lose funds compared to a, a normal year. Uh, so it, it will be uh, simple to identify that and report back to the province and how we're utilizing those funds too. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And it does strike me as the department that is um, has the most variability going forward as we kind of start to look toward reopening. We uh, It's hard to really have a fixed timeline in place. So I, I think that's great. The other question I had too was around this remaining um, $200,000. Um, is that basically going to be treated as like a discretionary um, money that's been set aside to be used either this year or next? Um, or are we going to um, keep it specifically for, I think it says revenue losses or opening costs. Is it, um, or is the thinking behind that that we're going to limit it to those things or could we use it for, um, you know, funding requests like what we saw at last week's uh, council meeting? Yeah, so my intention was that with that was, you know, to be conservative and hold some funds and, um, you know, because we, as we saw last year, sometimes there are other expense, unexpected costs that pop up. Um, but also, it, it could be utilized for those types of requests if council chooses to. Um, I would, I would caution towards, um, you know, giving funds away immediately. Uh, uh, at least holding on to that and and getting through the, the financial planning process um, uh, over the course of the next couple of months. And um, but certainly that's council's 
up to council how they choose to utilize those funds. Great, yeah, that makes, I mean, perfect sense that we wouldn't be making any um, big decisions on allocating money in advance of the budget, but um, it's good to hear that we have some flexibility as we go forward. So, thanks. And next we have Councillor Moore. Great, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Jennifer, for the report. Um, my question was along the lines of that 200,000. It sounds like um, most of these funds have been allocated, well, conditionally allocated in one way or another um, to make up shortfalls, et cetera. Um, we, we do know we have requests coming forward. And I guess my, my quandary is that um, many of the, the groups that are, that are needing um, some assistance COVID related are not getting a lot of help from other sources. And as an example, we have the Adult Learning Center who's put in hand washing stations. It's not really part of adult learning's mandate to do that, but um, we, we really don't have anywhere for people to wash hands downtown. I mean, we do have the one bathroom that's actually often occupied. Um, and I know that we do have the other bathroom on the agenda, but at hand washing in general, it's not being dealt with by Island Health. And, and we certainly have a lot of people who don't have access to proper hygiene. So that's just one example of um, specifically related COVID um, uh, costs that, you know, some groups may come forward to, to make a request. And I understand wanting to wait a little bit, but I guess I'm, wondering um, for those types of requests for only um, putting aside a small amount of money um, with COVID numbers through the roof really right now on the island um, and not really uh, decreasing if there's another mechanism for us to um, to utilize or, or what we do in those situations because I anticipate that there will be some groups coming forward, uh, requesting some some assistance um, at, who are trying to look after people in the community. Thanks. I, I guess if, if I'm not sure if you're looking for a response from me, I would just say um, that certainly, um, that was just a recommendation, but council can certainly uh, choose to uh, make a payment out of out of that allotment before the budget is adopted, if, if that's the desire. Right, and I guess just clarifying that the two hundred thousand is really what's allotted at the moment for those discretionary um, requests. Yeah, so that the intention behind that was um, other unexpected. Uh, increased costs or loss in revenue um, and in within that would be any other requests that council may want to um, acknowledge as well so how you choose to split that up is counts is would be council's decision how how they'd like to do that Great, thank you and trevor i see you uh, have your hand up yeah thank you mayor maybe just a point of clarity that as these um, requests trickle in uh, i think it's completely appropriate that council look at them, you know, as a one-off, uh, one-by-one basis. But uh, I think to the director of financial services point is that we always take a very measured conservative approach and, and uh, allocate the $200,000 now uh, because it aligns with our financial plan. But at any time a request comes in, council can uh, consider those use of those funds. Excellent, thanks for the, the clarification. And uh, next we have Councillor Hilling. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks very much to staff for the report. Um, while I appreciate that uh, there may be many unmet needs in the community, I think that we have to be very careful about not encouraging people to come to us for grants. Uh, we've suspended our grant program for this year, and uh, we we don't know the full impact of uh, of COVID on the, our, our taxpayers and, and particularly our business community. Um, Obviously, if people come forward, we need to look at, uh, at valid requests, but uh, I think we have to be cautious in how we, we move through this period. Um, and on that subject, uh, I just ask if staff could clarify, uh, while the, uh, the funds are not um, permitted to be used to artificially lower taxes, 
in effect, um, by uh, allocating them as proposed, we, um, we continue to fund our commitments to our staffing and program and policing and resources and such, which uh, obviously means that uh, we can maintain uh, levels of service without uh, the recourse to uh, a tax increase. Um, and uh, potentially, uh, we may actually even be able to uh, incur some small surpluses, which, which could also go towards uh, um, helping out our taxpayers. I wonder if you could, if our staff could comment on that, please. Sure, so um, yeah, so as Councillor Hillian commented, we can't take these funds and, and artificially just reduce the tax levy. But that being said, um, you know, if we look at, for example, 2020, we're still working on our year end financial statements. So I can't speak um, to those at this point, but you know, when the pandemic hit and, and um, we weren't, we didn't anticipate receiving additional revenue, we had to um, reduce our spending in some areas. And so ultimately at the end of the day, um, taking in these revenues um, may result in a surplus at the end of 2020 that becomes prior year surplus in future year financial plans and council can utilize prior year surplus um, however they choose within the financial plan. So ultimately, if uh, there was additional surplus created by, by taking these monies in, um, they could use a portion of that to help soften uh, taxation in future years if they so choose. Thanks for that. And I also wanted to comment on just how pleased I am to see that we can cover the cost of uh, the proposed downtown washroom uh, from these funds. And um, I just wonder if, um, if staff might be able to give a quick update on um, where our, our talks with the downtown business people um, are at in relation to uh, uh, hopefully moving forward with that project. Thank you to the mayor. Um, Councilor Hillian, I know that Kyle Shaw, our director of public works has been in constant uh, communications with the downtown group. I know that they were actually quite excited about the Duncan Avenue um, option. Uh, it hasn't been finalized in terms of what their preferred option is, but I suspect that'll be coming back in, in the coming days and I can report that out. Thanks very much. Excellent. And Councillor Theos. Thanks, Mayor. Um, thank you uh, for the report, Jennifer and team. Um, in, in, in the proposed budget um, for 2021, uh, Having you know been into the first month of the year so far, uh, we, obviously we don't have a crystal ball in front of us to to show us, you know, what the future will hold. And if things do a turnaround, and uh, you know we end up getting um, um, you know some more um, revenue from the recreation than expected, or if the um, gaming comes back earlier than expected, anticipated, and we don't have those losses. Um, do we have a plan to uh, pivot as in terms of um, where we can direct some of the funds uh, uh, that um, may, uh, may be saved as a result of some of those changes that could occur and uh, you know, maybe address uh, ventilation in some of our facilities, uh, um, you know, maybe uh, address some um, uh, address, um, challenges um, the downtown small businesses will be facing. Uh, as a result of the bridge um, uh, work that's going to be done um, for later in this year. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's basically my thoughts in regards to uh, where we can go in case things change to our benefit. Yeah, thank you for the question. So that's a really good point um, that, you know, we are holding those funds and that is, um, where we would intend them to be applied based on where we anticipate the losses to be. But if we don't uh, see those types of losses, um, then we would have to redirect those funds elsewhere. So we can still utilize these funds in 2022 as well. Um, they have the provinces, you know, identified that. Um, so if there are any other um, upgrades to facilities, we again, one of the things we have to keep in mind is we have to be able to tie these funds back to something COVID uh, related. So, but that being said, I, I feel like um, even as we're developing the financial plan, I'm, I think, I don't think it will be difficult to identify other expenses within our current year um, that we could redirect these funds towards. 
Um, we've tried to make sure that we're, I, we're really hitting those, those large items, not only for reporting purposes, but um, because those are our significant losses. But there are other several costs um, in, that are incurred in even, even things like uh, PPE, uh, san hand sanitizers. It really does all add up, but it, but it is small, lots of small little charges that are, are challenging to report on. But I feel confident that even if we, these revenues were to come back, we weren't needing to utilize them in 2021, we would be able to find other costs throughout the organization that they would qualify for to help uh, offset that. Or we could hold it and build it into the next year's financial plan too, if that were the case. So, um, and of course, the we can give an update to council later in the 2021 year to see where we're at. And so that will help as well. Thank you, Jennifer, well done. Thank you. All right, excellent. And we've got uh, Councillor uh, Moran. Hi, sorry, it's me again. Um, one thing about the, the bathroom is I know that there were different uh, um, amounts associated with, I think, having hand washing or not. So I'm hoping that we're choosing the deluxe model that does have hand washing. Um, so that's one thing. And while I appreciate direct, uh, sorry, Councillor, Hillian's comments about, um, you know, the grants and aid program is not happening this year, et cetera. I think it's no secret to the public that we've received, I know, it, I know it's not really a lot of money in the, in the big picture, but we have received these funds and um, part of the criteria is for vulnerable folks. It's fairly clear in the criteria for the funding. And I know that there are going to be um, you know, groups in the community that, uh, that know that, that know that, that that's part of the criteria and, and will be um, hoping that there can be some assistance. So I think that, you know, normal grants and aids are not necessarily, well, they haven't been COVID related because we haven't awarded any since COVID started. So I, I think that we do need to um, anticipate that there will be some requests and that that obviously we'll have to scrutinize those requests but um but absolutely we should be considering um considering those because there is criteria with with this money received to assist vulnerable persons so i just want to make that i don't think it's um you know to not in, not necessarily invite people to come, but I think it's it goes without saying that 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 this is publicly <laughs> promoted as uh, um, COVID recovery and includes um, vulnerable folks. So I just wanted to make that that point that it, it is a bit different than just regular grants and aid. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor uh, Morin. Um, and oh, Jennifer, did you want to respond? Okay, and, and I, I think, you know, one, one thing, oh, Trevor, your hand went up, that's all, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, if I could just respond to Council Marin's first uh, comment in regards to the, uh, the options on the, uh, the downtown washroom. Once we complete our engagement process with the downtown group, we'll be coming back to Council with a preferred site selection. And in that will, be, uh, will also be a, a full suite of options that Council could con contemplate for that downtown washroom. And one of those, you, you might recall, specific to the Portland Lou was a, uh, a drinking fountain inside the washroom. I will say though, in, in consultation with uh, our director of public works, the preference is, is to possibly install a drinking fountain outside of the washroom. And I think that's simply because not everyone who wants to have a, have a drink of water wants to actually use the, the facility. So it might be a better option, but it's something that council will contemplate at the time. Great, thank you. Excellent. Uh, and um, one, one thing I was going to mention is, as well, uh, and I know we haven't had any uh, specific grants and aids uh, due to, uh, to COVID uh, that people have necessarily applied for, but uh, back in March, we did uh, provide funding to the uh, Homelessness Coalition, um, uh, some specific members uh, like the Food Bank, et cetera, to uh, help keep their um, uh, processes uh, meandering along. So it is something that we have reacted with. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, that sets us up uh, from a precedent uh, perspective 
Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that those are great points, Councilor Morin, for bringing those up. Um, and with that, I don't see any further questions or comments. Um, uh, oh, Councilor Hillian. Were you? Sorry, Mayor, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. No, fair enough. Uh, so seeing no further uh, questions or comments, um, uh, I'll uh, pull council, uh, starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor, Mayor. Councillor Frisch. I'm in favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Morin. Oh, Councilor Morton, how did I make yeah. <laughs> you? You had all those great comments to make. My apologies, Councilor Morton. Thank you. Uh, so that's unanimous. And moving right along, we have the uh, Comox Valley uh, Regional District Regional Park Service proposal. Move for a seat. Second. second. Excellent. That's been moved and seconded. And I'll pass it over to staff, I think. Trevor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think this, this request is something that's been discussed and certainly contemplated for some time. It, it's fairly straightforward in the sense that um, there was a background study already approved at the CVRD. I will say what's interesting about this, and I think the important distinction is, is that the request also contemplates the establishment uh, bylaw coming forward before the background study. And it's very typical that the background study would provide the information, in particular, the funding model that's necessary for uh, potential participants um, to uh, enter into that service. So it, it is a little bit unique. I, I think we all know the uniqueness or what the potential issue was around this and the impetus, which, which I think is valid. I have reached out to uh, Russell Dyson, uh, the CAO with the, with the CVRD, uh, to discuss some potential funding uh, models that may be used. Uh, I have yet to see that information and I'll certainly report that back to council, but I think at this point it might be appropriate for council to uh, refer this to staff for a staff report and we can include the potential uh, funding models in anticipation of the establishment bylaw. All right, thanks for that. Um, and so uh, Councillor Killeen, I don't know if you had a question or if you're thinking of moving uh, that motion. No, I'm, thanks, Mayor. I do think that's um, a good way to proceed, and I was hoping that uh, our staff would uh, want to report on this and discuss the implications uh, so that we can respond to the request in the letter from the RD, which basically uh, they're looking to see are we generally wanting to get on board with this or not, um, and suggesting that uh, if we can do that beforehand, that uh, helps to streamline the process. So um, I'd certainly be prepared to move uh, that we ask for a staff report if you uh, if you want to dispense with the receipt motion. Uh, sure, uh, I'll, I'll assume uh, a full um, unanimous on receipt and uh, and then if you'd like to make that motion. Yeah, so I'll move that we request a staff report uh, regarding the implications of a regional uh, parks uh, function. I'll second that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I don't see any further questions or comments. So I think that might be uh, good enough and I'll uh, maybe poll council unless there's any questions. I don't see any. So starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well, excellent. I didn't forget anybody that time, so that's great. All right. Uh, moving right along, uh, City of uh, North Vancouver letter to the Minister of Environment regarding the province-wide ban on uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. Move for a seat. Move a seat. Second. Excellent. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty happy that I actually pronounced that somewhat close, I think. Um, and I don't know, uh, Councillor Hilling, did you uh, have some comments? Thanks, Mayor. I wanted to acknowledge that uh, I believe it was last summer that uh, we received a lot of uh, um, letters from an email from uh, residents at the encouragement of the SPCA, I believe, um, asking us to support a ban on rodenticide. Um, and at that time, uh, I believe we had assurances from our staff that the city doesn't make use of this. 
Um, but I don't know what the implications of a ban are. And uh, I certainly encouraged uh, people to, uh, to look at perhaps having the SBC actually present to council so that we could give it uh, a fuller consideration. Um, but I'm just wondering if staff have any comments on uh, uh, where they think we could potentially go on an issue like this. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. It, uh, yeah, it's certainly an interesting discussion. I, I might pass this over first to Wendy Sarista, our corporate officer, and she can talk a little bit about her attempts uh, with the SPCA for the delegation. Thank you. From the CEO to Mayor and Council, I did receive um, a letter in early December from the BC SPCA requesting to participate in a future council meeting to present as a delegation. I forwarded the application and uh, I have not yet received a response um, to that uh, communication. So the information is with them. We just have to see if they'll proceed with um, presenting. Thanks for that. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, I, I would suggest that um, uh, we not take any further action other than recede at this time, given uh, the possibility of that presentation. And before ask, asking our staff to do any work on such an issue, I think it would be good for us to be presented with the full uh, um, body of information on the issue. Excellent. All right. And I don't see any uh, further uh, comments on this. So uh, with that, I will assume uh, unanimous uh, receipt of, uh, of the um, letter from uh, the City of North Vancouver. Uh, next, we have internal reports and correspondence, and we have the uh, meeting minutes from the Finance uh, Subcommittee that was on, um, it says February, yeah, February 10th, 2020. It was a year ago, almost. If somebody can move receipt. Over seat. Second. Second. Excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, are there any errors or omissions on those minutes? And uh, uh, Trevor, did you have a comment? I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll pass this over to Wendy Sarista, our corporate officer, to uh, summarize the, the, the process for Council. Thank you. From the CEO to Mayor and Council. At its January 15th, 2021 Finance Select Committee meeting, the meeting minutes were adopted. And um, it is accurate, February 2020 was the committee's last meeting. Um, that was a result of the pandemic that the proceedings were paused um, given the uncertainty of our financial climate during that time. So um, the committee has resumed its meetings uh, as of January 15th, and those are the adopted minutes as presented. All right, and I don't see any uh, further comments. So with that, I'll pull council. Councillor Morin, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, no, sorry. Oh, it's all good. Um, all right. These are just for a receipt, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll just assume uh, a full uh, unanimous uh, receipt on that. And next we have resolutions of council. Councillor Hillian. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move that uh, council support the recommendation made by the Finance Select Committee. On, uh, and there's a longer title there, Council Select Committee on Alternative Asset Management, Funding Sources and Levels of Service Options. At its January 15th, 2021 meeting and amend the timeline identified in section six reporting of the committee's terms of reference to read, quote, the committee will submit its findings and recommendations in a written report to council no later than January 31st, 2022. And if there's a seconder, I'll speak to that. All right, and Councillor McCollum seconded that. Thanks, Mayor. As council will uh, will note, um, the Finance Committee uh, didn't meet uh, since February of um, uh, 2020, and that was primarily because uh, the COVID situation uh, had us all dealing with other priorities. When we met um, on January 15th, it was felt that uh, the work that was started uh, could in fact continue and produce some useful results. And thus uh, this motion to uh, amend the terms of reference uh, by lengthening the um, period of time and giving the uh, committee uh, the, the, this year to continue its work. Thanks. Excellent, thanks very much. And I don't see any further questions or comments. So 
Uh, if there are none, I'll pull counsel starting with Councillor Cole Hamilton. In favor. And Councillor Frisch. In favor. Councillor Hillian. In favor. Councillor McCollum. In favor. Councillor Morin. In favor. Councillor Theos. In favor. And I'm in favor as well. Excellent. Thanks very much. And lastly, we have an in-camera resolution. Mayor, I'm happy to move this. I'll, I'll move that uh, special in-camera meeting close to the public. It will be held January 25th, 2021 at the conclusion of the community as a whole meeting pursuant to the following subsections of the community charter. 91C, Labor Relations. 91F, Law Enforcement. 91I, the receipt of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege. And 91K, negotiations and related discussions respecting uh, the proposal of a municipal service. Second. All right, that's been first and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll poll council, starting with Council Cole Hamilton. In favor. Councilor Frisch. I'm in favor. Councilor Hillian. In favor. Councilor McCollum. In favor. Councilor Morin. In favor. And Councilor Theos. In favor. Actually, I'm in favor as well. Uh, so that's unanimous. And that just brings us to adjournment. Move adjournment. Second. Excellent. All those in favor? Any opposed?